I chose that. If you didn't, then you'll probably find out why by the end of this. <clears throat> I have nothing to disclose. Our objectives today to describe the diagnostic criteria of Ehlers-Danlos, to compare the different subtypes of Ehlers-Danlos, identify the comorbidities and complications associated with it, and then to discuss the special he health care needs and the screening required for patients who have this diagnosis. So I don't know what you all learned in medical school, um, but what I remember was a couple of slides somewhere in the lecture that also included Marfans that talked about some stretchy skin, maybe some hypermobile joints, something to do with collagen, and there were a bunch of subtypes that I didn't really commit to memory. Um, and beyond that, I don't, there was something about maybe needing echoes and a few other things, but we didn't go into great detail <clears throat> about this in medical school. Maybe study a little bit more about it whenever step time came around, maybe a couple of questions. Um, and pediatrics show up on test questions, but there might be one in an entire QBank. So not something that we see a lot of. So originally, there were 11 forms of Ehlers-Danlos that were named. And then in 1997, they simplified it into six types. But they didn't rename the types. They just kept their original types. So you see there's like not a type 5 listed there. Um, so the first three, classic, hypermobile, and vascular, were the, considered the common types. And then the bottom three were considered the rare types. And then there were some subclassifications <coughs> underneath those. Um, and that is the criteria that have been in existence until recently. In 2017, the International Consortium of Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes and Related Disorders released a series of papers that reclassified all of these um, syndromes into different subtypes, basing it mainly on the molecular problems. And so they've done a lot of genetic studies and said, you know, these are actually more distinct diseases than just one syndrome. And so they've tried to classify them as specifically as they can into these different subtypes. Genetics estimated to affect 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 20,000. It's quite a range. And part of that has to do with how things are being classified and the differences in classifications and diagnosis. So far, they have identified 19 genes, 19 different genes. The most common are the hypermobile and classic types. Unfortunately, hypermobile is the only one that does not have an affiliated gene mutation. Um, they're all associated with collagen formation or function. Not all of them are in collagen genes, but they may encode proteins that affect the way that collagen functions in the connective tissue. Some are autosomal dominant, some are autosomal recessive, and the new position of this consortium has decided that targeted sequencing of a certain panel of genes is the most cost-effective way to make a diagnosis. So instead of just meeting the clinical criteria, they're pushing to get molecular diagnoses on these patients. These collagen mutations are the most common ones that are affected. The reason they're pushing for the molecular diagnosis is it helps you to get a precise diagnosis so you can tell the inheritance pattern, you know how to counsel the families, maybe you know which specific comorbidities you should be screening for. It also helps in research so that if you have correctly identified which subtype they belong to, then it helps to further research and further classify these diseases. This bottom part is important. So a provisional clinical diagnosis is reasonable if you are unable to get a molecular confirmation. Either it's unavailable to you, the patient doesn't have insurance, you don't have, their insurance doesn't cover the testing, you're in a place that doesn't offer testing, maybe you're not um, in the US. One, if you've gotten molecular testing and you get one or more variances of unknown significance. So maybe they've got some variances in those genes, but they're not one that's previously been associated definitively with one of those subtypes. Or if no cause of variance are identified on any of the genes, but they still meet all of the clinical criteria, then you can give this provisional diagnosis. Um, however, if that's the case, you should not kind of focus in and say, this is what they have, and not look at other explanations for their pathology. 
common symptoms to all of the subtypes. Hypermobility is one of the most striking things. They have hypotonia. Most have delayed gross motor development. All, with the exception of a couple, cognitive function is not affected. Um, loose, unstable joints that are prone to dislocation, subluxation, and chronic pain. The skin can be soft and velvety and somewhat doughy consistency, or the super stretchy type that we're used to thinking of when we think of Ehlers-Danlos. Easy bruising and bleeding, poor wound healing and fragility. Some of the like key words that you'll hear is the cigarette paper scars, which is more common in the hypermobile type than it is in the classic, but we'll have a picture a little later. Unpredictable tearing of blood vessels is an important complication, and spontaneous rupture of organs, including the uterus during pregnancy. So this is where the diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos kind of hinges, is the Biden criteria. And so this is not to diagnose Ehlers-Danlos, but this is how you're saying that someone is or is not hypermobile. And it only tests a few joints. It's a scale of nine points. So you get a point for each pinky, a point for each thumb, for each elbow, and each knee. Um, so if you can bend your pinky back more than 90 degrees on each side, if you can pull your thumb down to touch your forearm on either side, if your elbows or knees hyperextend beyond 10 degrees, and this is measured with a goniometer, which I've never used, orthopedics uses this, so um, perhaps they'll help be helpful in definitively saying this, and I would guess genetics would probably have this too if they're seeing this. And then the other is can you, with your knees completely straight, bend down and place both palms onto the floor. A score of five or greater is considered positive. So it's not a scale of whether well, they're mildly hypermobile or they're severely, it's just, are they hypermobile or not is what this is designed to answer. In younger children or prepubescent um, adolescents, they tend to be more flexible than adults are, so they require six points as opposed to the five. And as you get older, you become stiffer, maybe from repetitive trauma or arthritis sets in, and so they only require four to be considered positive. So here is the thumb. And this might tell you um, why this is interesting to me. This is my three and a half year old daughter's hand. And that's her finger, which is not part of the Biden criteria, but um, you can see all of those joints kind of extend backwards. It's her knees, and then the pinky. She is three and a half, so I couldn't get her to bend forward and keep her knees straight. She just wouldn't cooperate. So, um, but this is why I kind of became interested in this disease process from the beginning. So. This is the table with all of the 13 subtypes that are now described, the genes that are affected, the proteins that they code for, and their inheritance pattern. So we'll go through them, a little, some of them a little bit more than others, but I've listed them all here because they're quite complex in how to obtain the diagnosis. So classic, autosomal dominant, major criteria, they have to have skin hypersensibility, and they're very specific about how far it has to extend at certain locations, and so you have to check very um, specifically in those places. And then generalized joint hypermobility, which is again defined by the Biden criteria that we just went over. Um, and then there was a list of the minor criteria that have to do with some more subjective things like easy brewing, soft doughy skin, dramatic splitting of the skin, these molluscoid pseudotumors or subcutaneous spheroids, epicanthal folds, or complications of joint hypermobility. And then a first a family history of a first degree relative who meets the clinical criteria. You must have both major, so the skin hypersensibility, and three minor, or both of the major. So this is what the scars look like. On the left is that cigarette tissue paper scarring that they talk about, and that's more common in the hypermobile type. <clears throat> this papyrus looking scarring is what is more typical of the classic. <clears throat> this is hemosiderin deposits. So they have easy bruising and so they get bruises in a lot of the typical places like the front of the shin and they get such chronic bruising that the skin actually gets hemosiderin deposits and staining from the chronic and recurrent bruising that they get. And then you can see the atrophic scarring on these legs as well. Here's some stretched out skin you can see. And then this is a subcutaneous spheroid, um, which are fleshy lesions. They can um, occur around pressure points. They're mobile, easily palpable, and sometimes calcified can show up on x-rays. And then the molluscoid pseudotumor looks like that, that are usually on knees and elbows. 
The second subtype is a classical like. So it, com it affects a different gene, a different protein, very similar to the classic type, which is why it's called that, except they don't have the typical scarring is the main difference. Um, they do not get atrophic scarring. They have the hypersensible and velvety textured skin. Some of the other things in the minor criteria that kind of stand out are these pisogenic papules, edema <coughs> in the lower extremities with no signs of heart failure. And they have um, acrogenic hands, which just means premature aging of the skin. So their hands look older than what their chronologic age is. But they are also um, more prone to the vaginal, uterine, and rectal prolapse. I've put the diagnostic criteria that is included in these new papers. I'm not going to go over all of the details of them, but you can see it's very specific with what is required of that list for each one of them. So this one needs all three major and a family history that's compatible with an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern, where the classic type is an autosomal dominant. So these are the pyzogenic papules. It's just subcutaneous fat that herniates through the fascia on the box of the heels and feet. Not usually painful, but they can be. Um, but you don't see them if they're not weight-bearing. So if they're telling you that it's there and you're looking and the patient is sitting and you're, you won't see it, they have to be weight-bearing to kind of push the little fat out. Cardiac valvular is the next subtype. Um, this one obviously affects the heart more. So aortic dilatation <coughs> can affect the aortic valve and the mitral valve. They also have the skin manifestations and often have pectus deformities. There's a pectus. Vascular. So this is one of the more common subtypes. Autosomal dominant. This one is the scary one because these are the ones that have a reduced lifespan due to complications of EDS. These are the ones who have spontaneous arterial rupture at a young age. They should absolutely not play contact sports. Um, they can also have spontaneous organ rupture of the sigmoid colon. Um, of the uterus during pregnancy, even if they've never had a C-section, they can have extensive wounds with poor healing. They can also have this carotid cavernous sinus fistula formation, um, which in someone who has vascular is going to present with a red painful eye or a new headache. Minor criteria, they have the more thin translucent skin where you can see the underlying vasculature. They have spontaneous pneumothorax, some club feet, and it's interesting in this one, like they specify which foot abnormalities they're talking about. Um, also early onset varicose veins. This one is less specific in their criteria. They're saying that if you have a family history of any of these things, or if you have any of this sigmoid rupture, spontaneous pneumothorax, or any of these features that make you think it could be vascular EDS, then you should get the gene study because it's important not to miss it because this can kill them. So if you suspect this one, you should probably test for it and not worry about meeting all these specific things to rule it out. And it's one of the ones that has a very specific gene. Like there's one allele. So it's not, it could be one of five different gene mutations. It has a very specific one. This is what the translucent skin that they're describing looks like. Hypermobile. So this one is the most common monosomal dominant, and the one that has no specific gene mutation with it. It requires a very, now, a very strict set of diagnostic criteria. You have to have one, two, and three. So we'll, and each one of those is a very specific set in and of itself. So for the first criteria, you must have the generalized joint hypermobility, which is the Biden scale we talked about. Greater than five, if you are a child, greater than six, someone over the age of 50, you can reduce that to four if they also have this positive questionnaire, which is basically a historical questionnaire about when you were a child, could you do these things? We have a copy of that now. Can you now, could you ever place your hands flat on the floor without bending your knees? Could you ever bend your thumb to touch your forearm? Did you amuse your friends by contorting your body into strange shapes or could you do splits? As a child or teenager, did your shoulder or kneecap dislocate on more than one occasion? Do you consider yourself double jointed? A yes to these questions, two or more, um, suggests joint hypermobility. So this can be used in place if they are like one point away from meeting their Biden criteria in the older adult population. Criteria two, you have to have two or more of the following of A, B, and C. So this is A. Um, you have to have greater than five of the things listed under A. The soft skin, which is kind of subjective, unexplained stria, so um, people who haven't had rapid changes in weight or they're in an unusual distribution. Um, in men, 
the pyzogenic papules of the heels, we talked about some of the other, atrophic scarring, the pelvic floor, the urine prolapse, dental crowding, high narrow palate, arachnodactyly, which is similar to Marfan's with the thumb sign and the wrist sign, the arm span, which is also similar to Marfan's, and then here in this criteria two is the cardiac manifestation of mitral valve prolapse based on strict echo criteria and the aortic root dilatation. So five of those things to get a check off on criteria A. Here's your thumb sign and wrist sign. Feature B, a positive family history with one or more first degree relatives who also independently meet the current diagnostic criteria for hypermobile EDS. And then feature C is musculoskeletal complications. You have to have at least one of these. Musculoskeletal pain in two or more limbs recurring daily for at least three months, chronic widespread pain for three months, or recurrent joint dislocations or frank instability in the absence of trauma. Then we get to criteria three. All of the following must be met. Absence of skin fragility. If they have skin fragility, maybe you should be considering a different type of Ehlers-Danlos and not the hypermobile type. Exclude other heritable and acquired connective tissue disorders, including autoimmune rheumatologic conditions. And if you have an autoimmune rheumatologic condition, then you cannot use the criteria of the chronic pain in your criteria. So you can have rheumatoid arthritis and Ehlers-Danlos. That's, you know, lightning can strike twice. But you can't use the pain criteria. So then you'd have to meet A and B, and you can't use C to make the diagnosis. And then you have to basically a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude other things like Marfan syndrome, Louis Dietz, skeletal dysplasia such as osteogenesis imperfecta based off of history, physical, or molecular testing. So they've made a form that kind of condenses this a little bit to give you a checklist to make sure that you've checked all the right places. Um, and this has been done kind of in response to try and get rid of it being this wastebasket diagnosis of people just kind of calling it that without any real justification. The hope is that by making this stricter that they can better research and actually identify this group of people better. So the question then becomes, what do you do with the people who were previously diagnosed with hypermobile EDS who don't meet these criteria? And that is an issue, and they do have real problems, so you can't just tell them, oh, it turns out you don't have Ehlers-Danlos, you're totally fine, you don't need anything, because people don't like that very much. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit. We'll quickly go through the remaining types. This is arachnochalasia. Um, notable for congenital bilateral hip dislocation. They have kyposcoliosis, tissue, fr tissue fragility, um, and hypotonia. Dematosporaxis, they have extreme skin fragility with congenital or postnatal skin tearing. They have excessive skin folds at the wrists and ankles, palmar wrinkling. Um, here's some of the other kind of minor criteria for it. This is Sarah Gertz. She is a model who has this type of EDS. She's in her 20s, so you can see the wrinkling and the premature aging of her face related to this disorder. Um, so she has kind of taken a stand and goes out and tries to increase awareness of her condition. The kyposcoliotic type, um, major criteria, hypotonia, early onset, kyposcoliosis, and then the generalized hypermobility. You can see some overlap with other connective tissue disorders, such as the blue sclera, the ruptures of medium-sized arteries, marfanoid habitus, refractive errors. This one has gene-specific criteria, so they've identified several genes, and then once you've identified a specific gene, you have to kind of meet the criteria that are associated with your specific genotype, or genotype matching. Brittle cornea syndrome, so this one doesn't have EDS in the name, um, but it is mainly affecting the eyes. Um, it can have some deafness associated with it. And some of these are interesting, like they'll say just that there's a foot deformity, but then this one has like specific ones that they are <coughs> including in their criteria. So <coughs> spondylodysplastic, um, they have bowing of the limbs and short stature as opposed to the previous that had marfanoid and very tall um, osteopenia. And this is the one that has the cognitive impairment and not just the gross motor. Um, some more gene specific. They can have a single palmar crease, which is interesting. I, you know, we hear that and we automatically think of one specific diagnosis of Down syndrome, but it can also have that. Musco-contractural is what it sounds like. So they have contractures and not just um, the flexibility. 
Um, so they tend to have the proximal contractures and distal hyperextensibility of their joints. They get large hematomas, peculiar fingers. They can have some typical facies, which they did not go on to describe. They're prone to spontaneous pneumothorax and hydronephrosis. So if they have this subtype, those are some things you may want to look for. Myopathic, that's what it sounds like. If you biopsy their muscles, they have myopathies. And so they have muscle weakness, um, which will improve with age, fortunately, as compared to some of the other myopathic diseases we know about. This one, the periodontal, affects mostly the gingiva and the teeth, but you also have this acrogeria, the prominent vasculature, um, the hypersensibility, and joint hypermobility. Finally, we get to the hypermobility spectrum disorders. This is where we put those people that used to qualify for hypermobile EDS that no longer do. Gone is the diagnosis of benign hypermobility. That is not a thing because they've decided this is not, in fact, benign. That calling it that kind of minimizes people's experience that they may be in an asymptomatic phase of their disease process, but that it does have significant pathology and does cause significant impairment in these people's lives, and so it shouldn't be, um, the term benign is gonna cause clinicians to kind of just write it off and not pay attention to what these patients are going through. Um, and this is also, so you have to exclude the other causes of hypermobility. Um, it can be localized or generalized, and it all falls on a spectrum that you can move from one to the next without being said that you were misdiagnosed or have any change of diagnosis. So this is what it kind of looks like. You may technically fulfill Biden criteria but not have any symptoms, and you'd be on the far end of the spectrum with asymptomatic joint hypermobility. And then it goes across all the way with increasing symptoms or increasing joint involvement, all the way to the end of the hypermobile EDS diagnosis. It's also important to note that we're about to go into some of the comorbidities associated with Ehlers-Danlos, and that these hypermobile spectrum disorders can also have some of these comorbidities that are not affiliated with the diagnosis. So some of you may have heard of these different things that we're going to get into, like POTS or mast cell activating syndrome, um, some of the GI disturbances, and some of these other things. Everything that we've gone over so far, none of that is in the diagnostic criteria. Those are comorbidities that are associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and with hypermobile disorders but they're not part of the diagnosis. So if someone goes on Google and they've read about this disease and they say, I have all of these things, I must have Ehlers-Danlos. You cannot make that diagnosis based off of those comorbidities. You have to go back to this, which is probably best done by a geneticist and not by any of us. But you should know who to refer. So this kind of goes to the pathology of what we just talked about. They get macro traumas, which is obviously the dislocations, subluxations. You know about it, you feel it. You have an acute episode um, with pain and loss of function. The microtraumas are not as obvious. It's subtle and over time that they accumulate and lead to over time joint destruction <coughs> and chronic pain. Some of the thoughts of how this contributes is due to decreased proprioception and small fiber neuropathy. Um, and then some of these other associated conditions we'll get into. So these comorbidities, hypermobility, chronic fatigue, GI disorders, orthopedic injury, chronic pain, neurologic and spine complications, autonomic dysfunction, TMJ dysfunction, mass activation syndrome, and then psychiatric symptoms are all associated with most commonly the classic and hypermobile types that can occur in many of them, and they also occur in the hypermobile spectrum disorders. We'll quickly kind of go over the things that are specific to classical. So the cardiovascular complications of aortic root dilatation, mitral valve prolapse, they need echoes. Um, if their echoes have been normal through their adolescent, childhood adolescence, once they reach adulthood and they've had two stable in a row, then the frequency can be reduced. GI, they typically have irritable bowel syndrome type stuff. They can have nonspecific abdominal pain. If you do scope them, you need to be aware that they may have fragile tissue and may bleed more than you would expect. They have poor oral, dental health, TMJ dysfunction is common, which can lead to headaches. They often need braces because of dental crowding. And they can have some eye manifestations, so they should see eye doctors pretty regularly. The skin, so we know about the complications in the skin, so what can you do about it? Avoid trauma, avoid contact sports, maybe shin splints if they're constantly keeping the bruises on their shins, may protect them from getting that hemosiderin deposits. If they have um, wounds that need to be closed, you should apply stitches and layers, much, much more than you think is needed for the wound to heal. 
um, and avoid putting tension on the skin. The tension can create more tearing and prevent it from healing well. They recommend that it be done by someone who's, you know, plastics or derm or someone who is more familiar with dealing with it, um, and that you should leave the stitches in twice as long as you normally would because they have the delayed wound healing. DDABP is found to be helpful by some to decrease bleeding time whenever you know that you're going to have a procedure that may cause bleeding, such as dental procedures, or if they're having recurrent nosebleeds, it's been helpful. And then avoid excessive sun exposure because they already have the premature aging of their skin, so um, that may help to prevent that some. Pain management is important. Opioids, opiates are a last resort, despite what some patients who have this um, may tell you. Um, it's a complex, multifactorial um, support to get them through their pain. Cognitive behavioral techniques, relaxation techniques, regular, light, non-weight-bearing exercise. Then in pregnancy, it's important to know that they are at risk. Um, breach presentation is common if the baby has Ehlers-Danlos, which is interesting. This graph is from a paper that talks about the utility of physical therapy in children who have Ehlers-Danlos, specifically um, the hypermobile type and the hypermobile spectrum disorders. And they, this paper was written before the new classification, so you'll see this um, abbreviation, the joint hypermobility syndrome. That's the old diagnosis. Um, but this paper was still released at the same time as the consortium, so um, it's using kind of the old classification, but the data still kind of applies. And so it talks, interesting, about the different body structures and functions that can affect children. Um, so at the top, you see that they've got the psych symptoms, sleep dysfunction, altered body image and self-esteem, the ocular involvement, reduced proprioception. They may not um, be as affected by local anesthetics, and so that comes into, like, a dental block maybe didn't work is a common manifestation of that. Um, dysautonomia, which we'll talk about a little bit. They have the orthostatic dysfunction, reduced exercise tolerance, fatigue, joint instability, altered gait patterns, poor bone density. And then if you look off to the other side, it talks about how this might affect the child. And so um, if they need mobility aids, how does that affect the child at school? What if they have to go upstairs? Um, what about PE? Can they perform in PE the same way as their peers do? Or, but they look normal. What if they don't need mobility aids and then they're getting out of PE? How does that affect the child's self-esteem with their peers if they're unable to do what their peers can do or they're being told that they can? Um, talking about exercise tolerance, if they're in PE and you're being encouraged to push through, push through, but they're in pain, and they don't realize that their pain is abnormal um, and that they have a reason for that pain that's not like other people. Um, it also talks about some of them have urinary incontinence for a long age or need to go to the bathroom more frequently. And so if school is very strict about that and then they have an accident at school, how does that affect them? Um, so when they're younger and they're in the beginning parts of their disease process, then perhaps they have an advantage. You know, they're really bendy and flexible. They can do some cool stuff. Maybe they're really great at gymnastics. They're showing off a bit. They're not really hurting. Um, they may be predisposed to injuries, but if you're a kid, they don't know or care. They don't think about that whenever they're doing these things. But when symptomatic, you can usually look back and find some manifestations of this in childhood and adolescence, even if it wasn't diagnosed at the time. Looking back, you can usually see it. They may have just a couple of painful or unstable joints, or it can be a complete chronic widespread pain. They typically have a delay in motor development, gross and fine and may have reduced um, gross motor abilities. They may be clumsy due to their de decreased proprioception. This kinesophobia is being scared of doing things, and so this decreased proprioception and joint instability may make them more fearful as toddlers and children. So um, this manifests kind of in my daughter, so she hates anything with trampolines or bounce houses or anything where she's not on stable floor. She won't jump. Even on solid floor, I mean, she might jump like an inch. Um, doing tumbling is really unusual, so they may refuse to do cartwheels or do those sorts of things. Um, they also, interestingly, can have a decreased patellar reflex, um, going back to kind of that neuro neuropathic involvement. And then problems with falls, they're clumsy, poor coordination, may have gait issues. Sorry. So 
some of the things that these kids can have difficulty with, if they've got joint instability and they're getting microtraumas, then they adapt and compensate, right? So if a kid can't do something, they're very quick to find another way to do what it is that they want to do. They're not going to just stop. They're going to adapt. And so that may put overload and strain on the other parts of the musculoskeletal system, which then creates trauma in those areas. Um, pain is exacerbated by activity. This is distinguishing from most other musculoskeletal complaints in children where pain is improved with activity. Pain is made worse. In one study that was done um, several years ago, and there were um, a couple hundred kids, all children, 100% of them, reported experiencing pain in the 24 hours after exercise. Some were immediately after, some later that evening, and some the following morning. But they all had increased pain with exercise. Knees and shoulders are the most commonly affected sites of pain. And then it's important to know that the parent and self, child self-reported pain are highly correlated. So if the child says that they have pain or if the parent says that the child has pain, when they ask them independently, those rates match. So if the mom says, I think they're in pain, they most likely are. However, the parents do tend to underestimate their child's perception of the pain. So if the mom's telling you that the child has pain, then they likely do. There are three phases that we kind of touched on earlier. So in the beginning, they maybe don't have a lot of pain, and so they're kind of pushing themselves. The pain is limited to the lower extremities. Maybe some of these kids that we're saying are having growing pains, um, this chronic lower extremity pain can be related to hypermobility instead. They may have a lot of difficulty with handwriting and repetitive tasks, um, easy fatig fatigability and voiding dysfunction, and then this developmental dyspraxia, which is this nonspecific delay <coughs> in gross and fine motor skills, but it spares the cognitive and behavioral development. Next is the pain phase, where you get generalization and progressive musculoskeletal pain, sometimes misdiagnosis fibromyalgia, um, pelvic pain, headaches, paresthesias, mixed GI disorders, orthostatic intolerance, and then they get the stiffness phase where maybe they don't meet Biden's criteria anymore because of all of these traumas that have led to early onset arthritis. And this is where they get more of the pain and fatigue that can become disabling. Another kind of identifying feature is that they have significant pain before there's any evidence on x-rays. So significant joint pain with normal radiographs is suggestive of this. Um, they also have nerve pain, but the testing for it does not show up whenever you do the electrodiagnostic testing. Um, they think that it is due to the very microfibers. Um, one of the problems with this is that children are often not believed by their parents, by the physicians about their pain or their mobility. Um, it can present with more recurrent or chronic pain. Some of them are misdiagnosed as a behavioral complaint, or if they're coming in with repetitive subluxations and dislocations, maybe they get called CPS because someone thinks that it's an abuse case when it's really just a manifestation of the child's disease. Um, we talked about the proprioception a little earlier. Um, and part of one of the studies that was done um, in 2015 talked about improving proprioception, targeting that specifically may help with the pain that is experienced by stabilizing those joints and increasing their functional abilities. And it was interesting, so this is in adult patients, but the impact of the pain and functional impairment was worse than that of rheumatoid arthritis when they compared them by doing questionnaires about their quality of life. And so this is significantly um, impairing these patients, but they don't have physical exam findings that people can see and say, oh, that looks terrible. You know, so they feel like an invisible illness kind of. Um, so physical therapy is one of the main things that can help. Stretching has to be limited so that you're not further exacerbating stretching those joints beyond the normal range of motion. And a small study in 2010 showed that children going through a six-week generalized program improved muscle strength and fitness, um, and it also improved their systemic complaints. And so they had increased um, improvement in their fatigue and in their mood their pain scores um, were decreased with this as well. The important thing is that you can't just say go to the gym and exercise more because as we said earlier, exercise exacerbates their pain. So you have to have someone who has training in the appropriate way to exercise. They need to be um, guided, gentle, um, gradual exercise programs through physical therapy. 
um, because the wrong exercise can do damage. So it has to be kind of in the right way. Um, unstructured, unsupervised exercise is not recommended. If they are going to do things on their own, they recommend things like um, cycling or swimming, things that are not weight-bearing, per se. Supportive shoes, because they kind of have collapsing arches. Braces have been used intermittently, but haven't really been shown to be all that beneficial, so it's kind of taken as a case-by-case -case basis. The same with surgery. They've tried to fix these. If there's a particular joint that's hypermobile that's causing a lot of the problems, they have tried to go in and say, well, we can operate on this and fix it, but it almost never works. So the skin and fascia, we've kind of already talked about these, that they're more fragile than normal, but not as bad as the typical or classical EDS. They may get these stretch marks um, with rapid weight gain, not associated with rapid weight gain. But interestingly, their skin is stretchy enough that they may not get stretch marks with pregnancy. So it's kind of a, um, they get them in we at a weirder distribution. So chronic fatigue, unrefreshing sleep, post-exertional malaise, impaired cognition and memory, um, greater pain and functional impairment, psychological distress, stimulants are effective for a short period. Um, <coughs> exercise is effective, but it takes a long time to build up that effect and see a difference. Sleep management, so this is gonna be managed the same way that you're gonna manage other people. You can try melatonin. Sleep hygiene is the mainstay. Um, avoiding screen time, going to bed on time, using your bed only for sleep those sort of things that we kind of know. Relaxation techniques, avoiding large meals. Um, one of the kind of newer things, and they have a lot of apps for these too, with like this um, progressive muscle relaxation where you kind of concentrate on relaxing certain muscles at a time and has like calming music and meditation, those sort of things. Um, yoga, massage, music or art therapy. Some of the cardiovascular. So this is a bit of a controversy. So uh, mitral vote, Mitral valve prolapse and dilatation of the aortic root are the manifestations that are seen. However, they do not usually progress and do not usually cause significant pathology. Previously, they needed echoes done um, at least every three to five years. Um, and then if once they got through adolescence and they've had several normal, you could decrease the frequency. The newer guidelines that just came out last year saying because it is unlikely to progress and unlikely to cause problems, that you don't even need to do an echo unless you have clinical suspicion that there's some sort of involvement. However, when we were going over the clinical diagnoses earlier, if you notice those last two things included aortic dilatation and mitral valve prolapse, and so they're saying you don't even need to get a baseline echo, but if you're doing it as part of your diagnosis, then I don't know that I would, that I necessarily agree that they don't need one. They're kind of contradicting themselves a little, but so much to say that's kind of, I don't know how much people are going with this new guideline to say that they don't need echo screening, but dysautonomia. So this is kind of a interesting topic that has been getting a little bit more press lately as people are reading about it on the internet and self-diagnosing themselves. So it's got a few different things. Um, it's thought to be due to inadequate cerebral perfusion, heightened adrenergic tone, so they feel um, palpitations, tachycardia, atypical chest pain, presyncopal, um, sweating, dizziness, kind of this overall bad feeling. They have not been able to really tell what exactly has caused it. There's a lot of theories about it, um, but it is well described and highly associated with hypermobility syndromes. So the people who have said it have met criteria in multiple studies that have showed that these things kind of go together. Some of the um, symptoms that they have described, um, POTS is the one that gets the most press. So it's this postural orthostatic tachycardia. So we all know about orthostatic hypotension. You stand up and you've got the change in your heart rate and your blood pressure. This is just the heart rate criteria of it. So they don't get hypotensive. They just get tachycardic whenever they go from sitting to standing or position changes. And then they get those feelings, that orthostatic kind of feeling and presyncopal feeling with it. And people can have this ongoing, like throughout the day. Can you imagine every time that you stand up getting that feeling, how disabling that could be if it's severe? Some of the ways that they think this may be affected, um, maybe it's abnormal connective tissue that's causing them to not um, contract in the way that they should to return blood volume when you stand. There's a delay in that um, vasoconstriction. It leads to venous pooling and hemodynamic and symptomatic consequences. Medications that they're on, so maybe some of the medications they're on for all those other things that they have are contributing to it. Maybe they've got elevated circulating histamines or catecholamines. 
maybe there's some autoantibodies involved that have not yet been detected. Um, some of them are more prone to Chiari malformations and craniocervical instability. And so if you have the ligaments in your spine and where your spine connects with your skull are a little bit looser, then perhaps that's contributing. And then some hyper-responsiveness to adrenergic tone. Um, so this is kind of what we talked about. This just goes into a little bit more detail um, about the specific diagnosis. Potential triggers, there are lots. Some of them can be physical. Um, so high altitudes, other illnesses, valsalva maneuvers, exercise, dehydration. Um, interestingly, allergic reactions can all kind of do this. Differential should be considered before calling it this. So this is the um, kind of diagnostic criteria, and it talks about doing some of the simple clinic tests where you can do, just like you would take orthostatic vital signs, you don't necessarily have to do tilt table testing. But if you do, it should be in a quiet room. The temperature should not be too hot or too cold. They should rest supine for five minutes before testing, and you should empty your bladder before doing it. This gets to some of the specifics. Um, the neurally mediated hypotension and then orthostatic intolerance are also on the spectrum. So the NMH involves hypotension. So this is your true kind of orthostatic hypotension. And then the orthostatic intolerance is if you have the symptoms, but you don't meet the criteria for the other two. So you don't get the tachycardia, you don't get the hypotension, but you have all of those symptoms, but you can't really document that they have either of the others. Beyond doing that simple testing, they have autonomic units and kind of these specialty places where they can do more extensive testing and kind of identify triggers and help manage these patients a little more. But some of the simple treatments that you can do is education on avoiding triggers, withdrawing medications that might be causing those symptoms, reduce venous pooling by wearing compression hose or socks, have them avoid rapid changes in position. Maybe they should sit for a few minutes before they go from lying to standing. Increased exercise where they can, although this is kind of one of those things that it should still be done in a monitored fashion. Lifestyle changes um, that are similar. We talked about before with exercise, you should also um, increase fluid intake is a big one with them. So if you're kind of on the dry side, taking in lots of fluid, adding extra salt, avoiding meals prior to exercise, um, and then not abruptly stopping exercise, they should have a cool down activity to stop the kind of drastic shifts. Here's some medications that have been used. Fluidocortisone is kind of one of the first line that they use, and midodrine is common, beta blockers, and then here's some other agents that have not been as well studied, but have been used by some of the specialists um, in the area. They have a propensity for headaches, migraines at an increased frequency. Again, the cervicocranial junction instability may be related to it, as well as TMJ. They can get scoliosis and postural kyphosis. They have the instability, so they tend to kind of lean over um, due to the poor ligament structure. GYN, similar to some of the others, preterm labor, so just delivery, uterine rupture, prolapse. GI, they get a lot of functional GI complaints, um, irritable bowel syndrome. They can have functional recurrent abdominal pain, dysphagia, increased risk of celiac disease and eosinophilic esophagitis. Some, so this isn't um, necessarily supported by the literature. This is just an expert opinion by a couple of guys who have said that they've had some success in treating it like they would treat irritable bowel syndrome with the low FODMAP diet. Um, constipation is very common. And so you're treating that in the same way that you would any child with constipation. Um, it's just important to watch for it. There have had some studies that have shown they have increased gastric motility. Some of them show they have decreased gastric motility. They're just likely to have some um, sort of GI complaint. Urinary, increased UTIs, voiding dysfunction. They may be more prone to having accidents and may take longer to become potty trained. This is also important for school to think about. The other big one that gets talked about and gets a lot of press is this MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome. So this is due to release of histamine and tryptase specifically, so you get all of those um, puritis, flushing, hypotension, it can exacerbate asthma, abdominal bloating and cramping, food sensitivities, and then they've been trying to pull this into the elevated tryptase levels. As you can see, 
once we've gotten through some of these, there's a lot of overlap between a lot of these comorbidities. So if you've fulfilled criteria for one, you've maybe fulfilled criteria for two or three of the others. So it's really difficult to try and tease out exactly which things these people have. Um, this kind of talks about the mast cell function um, and what it's intended role is and what it's supposed to do and these guys kind of go off on their own and get agitated and start releasing all of their um, intracellular particles over kind of benign stimuli instead of saving it for when they really need it. I've included their um, specific diagnostic criteria just kind of for completion's sake. So um, they have to have at least two of these symptoms. They have to have objective evidence by looking at some of these markers, elevated in blood or urine and then response to therapy that would normally be used to treatment. So as you would expect, antihistamines are the main treatment. Um, these are some of the typical triggers, drugs, alcohol, certain foods, physical things such as heat, exercise, invasive procedures, insects, emotional stress. Unfortunately, these people who have chronic pain, sometimes NSAIDs or opiates can trigger their mast cell activation syndrome. Um, here's some of the management. So H1 and H2 blockers, usually given at much higher doses than what we give for just hay fever or allergic rhinitis. They're, they're getting two to four times the normal dose and they're taking it BID or TID in order to control their symptoms. Um, you can use Singulair, avoid steroids if possible. NSAIDs, as long as it's not a trigger for that patient, may be helpful. There is an increased incidence of psychological issues with these patients, depression, low self-esteem, it is important to not blame their pain and their other symptoms on their psychiatric symptoms. It's a comorbid condition, not the causative thing. So if you're gonna use an antidepressant, be sure that you, they don't get the impression that you're telling them, this is all in your head, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just depressed, because that's what they hear often. Um, so impact on children. So how does this all affect our patients? They'll be less active in sports because of their chronic pain and their risk of um, injury. They may miss school more often compared to healthy peers. Um, they did kind of some surveys with patients who had hypermobile um, joints and found that parents reported an increased rate of difficulties at school, handwriting difficulties specifically, and difficulty with PE. Um, <coughs> symptoms may manifest early, but difficult to diagnose prior to the age of five, and it should be done by a geneticist. As you can imagine, if you have given them this diagnosis and then you have to take it back because they've got something else, they have built quite a large um, online community and support systems, um, and a lot of attention has gone to this, and so if they've kind of bought into this and feel like there's people that can relate to them, and then you take away that support system, it can be frustrating for the family. So um, the strict criteria should be met before you tell someone this is what they have. How can we help with school success? So the ehlers Danley Society, um, their website has a handout that is specifically addressed to teachers to kind of tell them what they should expect. So some of the ways that we can help if you have a patient who's been diagnosed with this, um, they may need a 504 plan, they may need ice packs, or they may need permission to take some over-the-counter medications, whether it's the um, antihistamines or NSAIDs or Tylenol at school whenever they're having pain. They may need excuses for PE. They shouldn't be playing contact sports or competitive sports. Um, if they are exercising, they need permission to say, you know what, I'm hurting, I need to stop, I feel dizzy, I need to stop. Um, they should be told not to push through the pain like what most other people are kind of are doing. They may have difficulty with tests that are filling in the bubbles and these repetitive movements of bubbling in, so maybe they need to have, for standardized testing, they may need special accommodations. Maybe they can speak out their answer, maybe they can type them, maybe there's another way for them to take their test. Um, because they may not finish the exam due to fatigue of their wrist and fingers, not that they don't know the answers. Um, consideration for more frequent absences, whether it's for therapy or for other doctor's appointments, or maybe they're having an exacerbation of some of these symptoms. More frequent bathroom breaks. So if they're having trouble with urinary incontinence and frequent UTIs, and then they're not allowed to go to the bathroom, and then they have an accident on themselves, and they're embarrassed and sad. Another one of the things that I wouldn't have necessarily thought about but may be helpful for your patients is to write a note so they can have two sets of books. So if they're not having to carry this huge backpack full of heavy books to and from school, they can have a set at home and a set at school, especially since they're prone to scoliosis and chronic pain anyway. Um, they should use a chair instead of the floor for circle time, maybe an elevator instead of stairs if they're having a lot of knee pain. 
Um, and then maybe give them a pass on their handwriting <laughs> if they don't have the stability to do the handwriting. Um, and things are getting more strict now for the younger age groups with handwriting and being a very specific thing that is being graded. And then just a quick word about emergencies. So in the vascular subtype, um, vascular rupture is the most common cause of death. So if someone has Ehlers-Danlos, especially the vascular subtype, and they show up with acute abdominal pain, um, you should think of intestinal rupture or at least rule it out. Um, a new severe headache or altered mental status can be rupture of cerebral vasculature. You should probably get CT or MRA. Um, this is common in young adulthood. And then this, we mentioned a little earlier, this carotid cavernous fistula, the painful red eye. They can hear the pulsations in their head, um, and it's worsened by high blood pressure. So those are vascular emergencies that can be life-threatening. This is the website I was talking about, the Ehlers-Danlos Society. They have a lot of patient support materials. All of the articles that were released by the 2017 consortium are there, free for viewing. They've also created kind of um, copies of those articles in less technical terminology for the public to be able to read and understand most of what is being said. So they leave out a lot of the technical stuff, but have done each and every one of those articles they have made a copy of. So they were very thorough in this release. Um, and May happens to be Ehlers-Danlos Awareness Month. At the beginning, I put the picture of the zebra, and it said, why zebra? And so this is directly from their website about why they've chosen this as their logo. Um, people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and hypermobility syndrome disorders um, often identify themselves as zebras. You remember med school when you hear hooves, you think of horses, not zebras, and they're advocating that perhaps sometimes it is a zebra. Many spend years pursuing a diagnosis for disorders that aren't well known or aren't expected in someone who looks normal or someone who is too young to have so many problems or too old. Even what we have might be considered too rare for anyone to be diagnosed with it. The zebra became our symbol to mean sometimes when you hear hoof, be hoof beats, it really is a zebra. Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are ex unexpected because they're rare. Hypermobile spectrum disorders are common but are unexpected because they remain misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. When you see a zebra, you know it's a zebra, but no two zebras have identical stripes, just as no two people with Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are identical. We have different symptoms, different types, different experiences, and we are all working towards a time when a medical professional immediately recognizes someone with Ehlers-Danlos or HSD. A group of zebras is called a dazzle. We are a community of individual zebras, and we are stronger together, and we dazzle. So I thought this was um, interesting. I learned a lot about it kind of with our suspicions. So, um, I think that is my last slide. Any questions? That was a lot really fast. <laughs>